Hey, this is Gary Tori. Welcome to Game Design Thinking. And this is my face. If you have been following the channel, you will notice this is officially the first video with my face in it. There are many reasons for changing the format, but the main one is that I already show my face in my courses, so I wanted to try something new with my YouTube channel and here I am. Moreover, I think this is an appropriate video to share my camera, specifically to show the background, because I want to talk about something I'm very passionate about. Not books for now, but all the games. As you can see, I have some old video games here. Medieval 2, of Centauri and Neverwinter Nights 1, and 2 are on the other side. And you should see my GOG library, which is full of gems of the past both games I played when I was younger and new old games I had never heard of before. And I think there's a reason for playing old games that goes beyond the nostalgia, at least for us game designers. In my opinion, playing old games has the potential to make us better game designers, even more than playing the last new hot game in the market. There's a reason why architecture students still study Vitruvius or musicians are still taking new things from Bach. So today I want to discuss the main benefits of playing old games. First, we are going to talk about how old games teach you about the history of our medium and why that's useful. Then we are going to discuss why old games are hard to get into and why that's a blessing in disguise. And finally, we'll talk about how playing old games can surprisingly improve the ideation process. Before continuing, remember that, as always, you can find a one-page summary in the description below. Let's get to it! First, learning about the industry. Specifically, the industry 20, 30 or 40 years ago can be done in many ways besides playing video games. For example, articles, biographies and even better, autobiographies can be an amazing way to jump in time and into the heads of the founders of the video game industry. Besides giving you random facts like why there are so many Sid Meier games even if he hasn't worked on them directly, Reading these books and articles can be a good way to expand your library of games, as they usually mention all the games they have worked on. For example, my first approach to Alpha Centauri was because Sid Meier mentioned it in his book, and coincidentally, a colleague mentioned the game after that. I bought the game in GOG and I was completely hooked on it. I became an absolute fan of the game. I even bought a physical version of it, for reasons I will discuss later in the video. Regarding video game history and specifically about game genres, playing old games will definitely expand your horizons. Game devs back then didn't have the huge pressure some of the AAA and AA companies have right now. With ever increasing budgets and currently being the biggest entertainment industry, some video game executives get very nervous about innovation and untested ideas, as well as non-performing genres. That's why we see more action and RPG games than anything else these days, not even to mention loot boxes and microtransactions, with little innovation to the core of the genre. As happened with movies and novels, the game industry is becoming more homogeneous in terms of genres, with high-performing genres not varied enough for the sake of safety, while other genres are drawn to obscurity by nervous, profit-seeking C-suit executives. Even Will Wright, creator of The Sims, had to fight against the corporate structure for many years to develop The Sims. Games developed 20 or 30 years ago didn't suffer such strong pressure to generate huge profits and they were also developed with smaller budgets, which gave them more leeway to innovate and come up with ingenious tropes and systems. Some of these mechanics and systems didn't stick at the time, either because video games were a relatively new field which pushed some people away, or because the technology and usability practices couldn't be appropriately implemented. 
The good thing is that some of these have been revived in new games by designers who have revisited these old games and have found a way to innovate around these old mechanics. Learning about the olden days will also give you a new perspective on the problems they had and how they solved them. Today, with so many resources, we take some things for granted like some standard button bindings or functional free-to-use game engines. But as we have seen in the last couple of months, these things are much more brittle than we believe. Playing these old games and reading biographies or accounts from back then has given me another perspective on these problems. I think these problems are opportunities and come at a merry time with AAA games more focused on adding more hours of gameplay rather than fun and game engines changing their fees any time they want, which will, in my opinion, bring major changes to the industry in the next years. By playing old games and reading these biographies, you can see how developers were very intelligent in solving problems and were also very ingenious in working around some problems without players noticing it, all while working with a very limited set of technology, which is an absolute wonder to play and enjoy when you have this extra information. For me, this is a huge motivation to become a better game designer, but also a better game developer in a more holistic way. Now, I would like to exemplify the second point with a story. When I was a child, probably around 8 or 9 years old, I was playing mostly FIFA 98, some random emulated games and Duke Nukem 3D. When a friend of mine got to school with a floppy disk for me to try a new game that an older cousin of his had copied from another friend. It was Pokemon Green. Now, you'll ask why and how on earth Pokemon Green got to a floppy disk, in which case I wondered the same. Just to put you into context, having a handheld game console was unthinkable for us, and most of us had crappy office computers at home because it was the new novelty our parents bought used from their companies. So in this second or third hand office computer my father had just bought, I installed Pokemon Green just to discover the game was in Japanese. That was a problem. My friends and I knew this game was something special, so we started a grueling process of trial and error, literally creating a game manual consisting of flowcharts representing the screens, a button list which was us trying to copy the Japanese characters and describe what they did so we could compare notes the next day at school. I can say this, this process was even more fun than getting to play the game correctly in the end. We were playing a game within a game which, as a coincidence, represents one of the most common tropes of games, having a character starting from absolute ignorance all the way to complete mastery. Anyway, the meaning of this story is that we were ready to do something that players today rarely do, going through the hardship of learning to play a game. In a recent interview analyzing his 40-year career, Warren Spector better known for games such as System Shock, Thief and Deus Ex, commented about this. In his words, we were pioneers back in the day, and people expected hardship. We are settled city dwellers today, and our audience expects comfort, usability and quality in all aspects of their experience. So why is this important for you as a designer? Well, as we already saw, Games back in the day required some hardship and some friction to be enjoyed. Going through this unnecessary effort to understand a game will make you better at deconstructing, analyzing and enjoying games from different angles. I mean, look no further than Sin Meier Alpha Centauri. This is one of my favorite old games despite the fact 
I never played when I was a child. So no emotional or nostalgic attachment to it. And look at this, 200 page official manual, a guide of PC gamer just to understand the game. If you just jump into the game, you will be greeted by an amazingly complex, but also very elegant and well-crafted management system, a simple yet resonating narrative, and a great amount of interaction between the player and the environment. But also you will experience a very clumsy interface and unintuitive playability. The same happens with Dungeons and Dragons. I think there's a reason why many of the first game designers in the industry started their careers by playing TNT. It's not because this was the ultimate game, if something it was a game that was so open-ended and in need of more structure that some players took the matter into their own hands which essentially transformed them into the first game designers of our industry. Players expected that hardship back in the day and going through that hardship eventually converted them into game designers. So how much more profitable would be for you who are already a game designer and have more tools at your disposal? Sorry for the short intermission. I want to let you know that I've just opened a Patreon, so if you want more content like this, join me on Patreon where you will receive access to exclusive content, behind the scenes videos and even mentorship opportunities. Thank you for supporting the channel and I hope to see you there. End of intermission. The third point and probably the most productive one in terms of output is that you will get new ideas. New ideas don't arrive in a vacuum, they are usually the result of mixing and matching existing stuff with a pinch of new. You will discover quite obscure games with great systems that you can modify for use in your games. And of course I'm not talking about straight copying the game systems, I'm talking about getting references from unusual games, giving these mechanics and systems a new life. You can see this in almost every game. Celeste takes from Super Mario Bros. In many aspects of gameplay, like the precise movements required to complete the levels, level sections, gates that impede movement back the level, and more. You can see also how the 4X turn-based genre adopted more and more the earlier Civs gameplay and structure in games like Old World or Humankind, while also adding innovations of their own to improve on them. In other words, you need to reinvent will check other cars' wheels and see how they can be used and modified to use in your car. We have UX and game design tools that weren't available back then, so we can use them to update these outdated mechanics. A good example from a commercial game of the three benefits I mentioned can be found in Tunic. In case you don't know, the game Tunic is an action-adventure game in which you control an anthropomorphic fox in a fantasy realm. Your character uses various weapons like swords and bombs to kill enemies or discover secret rooms, as well as find various other secret tools scattered around the world. Even a short look at the game will make you realize that much of its aesthetics and gameplay come from the old Legend of Zelda games. Not only some of the main mechanics like attacking or rolling are very similar, but also some specific tropes of these games like discovering secret rooms and the ruined kingdom setting in which the game takes place. Also, according to its designer Andrew Schultheis, the game was created to capture the feeling of the lack of context while reading a game manual when he was a child feeling of not understanding the game, but instead engaging the imagination to elucidate how this game would play. As I mentioned before with the Pokemon Green story, it was pretty common to play without game tutorials or even in foreign languages back in the day. This is captured neatly in Tunic. As you roam the world finding new treasures, you will find scrolls that will form a game manual of sorts. And as you can see, the manual is written in an ungraspable language, so you can get the mechanics proposed there only by the context provided by the images in it. Of course, Tunic improves a lot in this regard because its manual is designed to have this effect 
on players like they can't understand the manual, but the game gives you enough context and information to get and apply the mechanic in the end. Continuing the analysis of mechanics, if you play the game you will notice that the mechanics and systems are not that different than the ones you will find in early Zelda games. They are pretty much the same with little tweaks here and there, which, by the way, does not subtract from creating a game of this scale. If something is quite admirable how they adapted them to the modern player using an excellent usability and game feel. But the magic happens beyond the mechanics and systems because Tunic captures something much more important but also more ephemeral. Tunic manages to capture the feeling of playing an old game without all the hurdles and hiccups of actually playing them. I'm pretty sure it has happened to you to sit at your computer to play a game you remember from your childhood with the unmistakable feeling of nostalgia just to find it doesn't feel as amazing as what you remembered. Tunic, in turn, successfully grocks and transforms this feeling of nostalgia and adapts it to the new times of city dweller players who don't want to go to the effort of having to guess what game they are playing and are expecting high quality and ease of use in every part of their experience. That feeling can be captured by a designer who went through the conscious effort and hardships associated with playing an old game, that is, successfully transforming nostalgia. As a final note, I just want to say I'm kind of sad to see these old games disappearing. Some of them will be lost forever for either business deals that don't allow anyone to distribute them or because there is no platform willing to sell them anymore. Also it's great that some of these old games and consoles have made it to museums where you can get a bit of history and sometimes even experience these games. If you want to go even beyond the design of old games, you can explore how these developers coded their games or how they came up with the graphics and sounds which is a world on its own but it's as interesting as playing and deconstructing the design of these old games. And finally, if you want to get as close as you can to the minds of these designers, you can read biographies and autobiographies. We have so few of these kinds of books from game designers that any new book is worth reading. If you're here, don't forget to like, subscribe and activate the bell. Also, don't forget to get your one-page PDF summary of this video. Let me know in the comment section below what you will want to hear next and I will see you in the next video. Adios.